In 2018, Sony released the a7 III, and it was a huge success in the full-frame mirrorless camera world. But a lot has changed since then. Some of the competing brands have released their own cameras with similar or better specs. Sony has some newer technology in their own cameras, and the camera world in general is just asking for more. So three years after its predecessor, we now have the Sony a7 IV. Sony was nice enough to lend me one of the early units to try out and I'm so excited to share with you what I found. But I didn't want to just stand here and read specs or do super nerdy tests just yet. Instead, I wanted to take this camera out, use it how I actually use my cameras, see if anything stood out to me and show you some of the video and photos that I shot with it so you can make up your mind for yourself. So of course, I used this opportunity to venture to one of the most beautiful places on the planet, Peito Lake. I made a quick little travel vlog that shows off some of the things that you might be interested in, video quality, slow motion, low light performance, and more. And after the vlog, I'll show you some of the photography that I did with the camera on the trip as well. And ultimately, I'm gonna talk about some of the main upgrades that I noticed from using this camera in a practical sense, the things that actually made a difference in the way I work. Also, I'm shooting this all on the Sony a7 IV as well, so you can see how this looks. Now, I do plan to do some more nerdy tests with this camera as well, and I wanna open it up to you. In the comments below, let me know what you want to know about the Sony a7 IV, and I'll make sure to include as many of those answers as I can in a future video. For now, let's take a more practical look at this camera, enjoy the video, and I'll see you back here afterwards to chat. The following video was shot entirely on the Sony a7 IV. Originally, I had grand plans of coming out here super early and trying to catch whatever kind of a sunrise I possibly could. So I went and picked up one of these headlamps so that if I was walking in the dark in the morning, I wouldn't have trouble seeing where I was going. Then I slept in a little bit, took a little bit longer to get here than I thought. But in the end, I'm kind of glad because it's snowing, it's overcast. There's really no sky to see at all right now. So I don't think there was gonna be any kind of a sunrise anyway. The big question at this point is whether I'm actually at the right place or not. I think I am, but I also don't have any reception out here to actually check. this magical week or so in the Canadian Rockies right after fall, but before we get fully into winter where it starts to snow, but it's not cold enough to freeze over the lakes. And this year it happened to line up absolutely perfectly with the reopening of Peyto Lake. For the past two years, they've been doing construction and improvements to the area to make it easier to access and better when you're here. And it just opened again in time for that sweet spot with the snow. 
I'm really hoping that the lake hasn't frozen over already. Now you may recognize the name Peito Lake, and that is for good reason. It's one of the most iconic viewpoints in the world, and kind of for two reasons. The first of which is that the blue, the turquoise that this water is, is fantastically beautiful. The glacier water that feeds into Peito Lake leaves it with the perfect mixture of glacier silt and rock flower that give it that color. The other thing that Peito Lake is famous for is being shaped kind of like a dog head. If you're standing at the specified viewpoint, something about that angle just lines it up perfectly. If you go on Google Maps and look at kind of the overhead view, it doesn't really look like much other than a blob lake like any other lake. But when you're at that kind of magic angle right from the view, viewpoint, it just lines up too perfectly. I absolutely love that. I swear it's just some kind of weird magic. In the heart of every moment, there's a magic hour. The streams are ever flowing through the fields of wildflowers. Okay, I can no longer feel my fingers, so that means it's time to start heading back down. If you ever in your life get a chance to come down to Peito Lake, you just, you have to come see it. All right, I hope you enjoyed the little adventure, but let's talk about what it was like using this camera. One of the first things that I noticed the second I turned on the a7 IV was how fast it is. They put a new processor in it and it rips. Just the little things like the time it takes to turn on or wake up the camera actually make a bigger difference than you'd think when you're out there shooting. Another thing I assume has a lot to do with the new processor is the autofocus speed and accuracy. This camera has all the autofocus bells and whistles that we've seen in other new Sony cameras lately, and it's actually got a lot that trickled down from the flagship A1. Pretty sure I called that a little while ago, didn't I? I'm always excited anytime that a camera company comes out with a new kind of flagship model because that means that they're putting new things in there that are likely going to eventually trickle down to the stuff that you and I can afford. We've got face detection, eye detection, subject tracking, animal eye autofocus, bird eye autofocus, and all of those work in video modes as well as photo modes too. I ran into a family of bighorn sheep on my journey down to Peito Lake and a couple of birds as well. So I got to test it out and it worked pretty darn well, even with a difficult subject like a black crow that has very little contrast to find where that eye is. One thing that would have been on my deal breaker list for this camera is 10-bit video codecs like we've been seeing on the A7S III, FX3, A1, and luckily they've included them, but there's a catch. We got 10-bit files, which means that S-Log 3 is a go with this camera. We got all intra compression. We got the H.265 options as well. And we have 4K up to 60 frames per second. But if you're shooting 4K 60, there's going to be a super 35 crop, meaning you've got 1.5 times crop if you're using that 4K 60 mode. I can hear people hitting up the comment section already saying how this is unacceptable that there would be a crop in 4K 60, but. 
that's what we've got. Honestly, from a practical standpoint, I didn't mind it too much, but I don't generally shoot a whole lot of slow motion. So it might just be that it wasn't really impeding my normal process too much anyway. I personally thought that the quality of the 24 frames per second 4K was fantastic. It's oversampled from 7K footage now because of the new high resolution sensor. And even the 4K 60 footage is oversampled from 4.6K, so it looks great too. I had no trouble matching them together beautifully. And of course, you've still got up to 120p in 1080 without a crop. Another thing I wanted to test out was the low light capability. So in that initial scene at the start where I was just waking up, everything was pretty darn dark and I had to crank it up a little bit. I thought it did pretty well in the low light and I noticed that there's this kind of dual ISO thing going on, like a dual gain system type of thing. On this camera, the base ISO in S-Log3 is 800 and that switch seems to happen at 3200, which personally I found to be a much more useful place for that to happen. As I mentioned briefly before, another addition to this camera is the new 33 megapixel sensor, which means higher resolution photos for cropping or printing compared to the 24 megapixels of the a7 III. While I was on my trip, I did shoot a whole bunch of photos and I think they turned out pretty darn good. Did I notice a huge bump in quality, sharpness, editing ability from the Sony a7 III? Not really. The a7 III already produced fantastic images and these felt very similar to me in the way that they look and the way that they edited. This is something that I wanna do a bit more of an in-depth test on in the future though, maybe do some more side-by-sides. So remember to leave your questions and ideas in the comments. After having used the a7S III and the FX3 for a while now, I didn't realize how much I missed being able to use crop mode and the a7 IV delivered on that. In fact, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. If all you used on this camera were crop lenses and it was forced into crop mode all the time, you'd have a 14.5 megapixel sensor in photo mode and a 12.3 megapixel in video mode that shoots 4K at up to 60 frames per second. That's kind of like having a crop sensor A7S III in a lot of ways. And the Super 35 crop video image is now downsampled from 4.6K, unlike the crop mode of the A7 III, which used some kind of line skipping or pixel binning or some other method that's not as advantageous. Another big thing for me was having the new flip screen. It's a higher resolution from the a7 III. It's fully touch capable, including the menu system, which is the new menu system that we've seen on the Sony a7S III, FX3, and the A1. And of course, it's a flip screen. So for those of you who film yourself or prefer that flexibility, you got it. There's some updated hardware on the body that was helpful as well. The mode dial is their best one yet, in my opinion. They've got the different exposure modes on a top wheel while the main photo, video, and S and Q modes are on a dial underneath. I didn't find it particularly easy to change the main shooting modes because you have to push this teeny little button on the front and then gently move it, but I still think this is a good move forward from the previous design. We've got full-size HDMI, which is a great update from the a7 III. One of my favorite kind of weird little things is that the exposure compensation dial is now free spinning, it's lockable, and it no longer has the actual markings on it, which is great because you can customize it to whatever you want, but also you may have different settings for different modes. So it makes sense not to have the specific markings on it just in case you switch between modes and it doesn't line up anymore. Another big functionality update from the a7 III is that this camera has separate custom buttons, separate function menus, and the ability to have certain settings change between photo and video modes. For example, I don't use picture profiles when I'm in photo mode, so when I switch to photo mode, it turns those off. Also, shutter speed is generally constant in video mode for me, so if I switch to shoot some photos and I come back, I want it to go back to the shutter speed I had when I was in video mode before. This makes things so much much easier if you're a hybrid shooter and you're constantly going back and forth between photo and video mode. So there are a lot of new things about this camera. There are lots that I didn't even get to in this video, but these were the main things that stood out to me in a practical sense when I was actually out there shooting. Personally, I'm really happy with the upgrades that they put into this camera, and I think it's a great successor to the a7 III and probably the best full frame hybrid shooter camera that I've seen yet. The a7 IV will be available body only for $24.99 US or $30. 
$31.99 Canadian. So you can pre-order it right away. I'll leave a link down in the description for you. And then the cameras will start shipping in December, 2021. Like I said, there are a ton of other updates in here as well that either didn't affect me directly in my practical tests or that need a more thorough nerdy testing kind of video. So make sure to leave your suggestions and ideas down in the comments and I'll try and include answers in a future video. And on your way down there, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on future videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.